I am a sailor of small boats, uh, among other callings. And when I am out on the blue water of the San Francisco Bay, I'm intensely aware of the surface conditions that are affecting the balance and the course of my boat. Uh, conditions like the speed and the direction of the wind and the size and frequency of the swells. But there are also these even deeper and, and more powerful currents that move on a much larger scale around and through the oceans of the world. And they also affect the course and, and balance of boats, both great and small. The French theologian and sociologist uh, Jacques Ellul argued that there are the equivalents of these oceanic currents that operate within individual human lives. Powerful, potent, underlying forces that guide and direct uh, the overall underlying direction of individual human lives. One such oceanic current in my own life has been my work for over 40 years as a pediatrician scientist addressing the developmental and health challenges of children experiencing major trauma and adversity. But there is another more personal uh, deep current that has been present in my life for an either even longer period of time, and that is the, the one depicted in this snapshot of two children uh, on a Southern California beach sometime in the early 1950s. You may have already guessed that the seven-year-old boy on the right is me, and on the left is my five-year-old sister, Mary. Mary and I were the, the closest and best of friends uh, for the first 10 years of our lives, matched as we were in imagination and interests and temperament. But as we began to grow into an approach puberty and early adolescence, our lives diverged in profound and important ways. I embarked uh, on a life of what I think of as almost embarrassing good fortune with a long, productive and uh, um, gratifying, rewarding uh, career with a 45-year stable marriage with two wonderful children and now four grandsons. But by contrast, my sister Mary, her life became mired in a seemingly never-ending procession of, uh, of afflictions and, and misfortunes. At the age of 11, she developed a chronic biomedical disorder. Uh, she began after that uh, developing a variety of really important mental health symptoms. And by the age of 20, she carried a diagnosis of schizophrenia. In graduate school, she experienced an unwanted, unplanned pregnancy, and she delivered a birth-asphyxiated child uh, who was disabled. So there were these powerful, powerful differences in our lives. And one of the questions, two of the questions that I have pondered for all of the years of my life, virtually, are these questions of why and how. How is it that two children, conceived of the same parents, born into the same family, the same neighborhoods, attending the same schools, had such dramatically and importantly uh, different life trajectories. Now, we know that there are many factors that influence the differential illnesses and health of, of individual children. But one factor that up until about 15 years ago we tended to overlook and ignore is the factor of adversity and trauma. These are the kinds of adverse childhood events, childhood experiences, such as physical and emotional maltreatment, uh, loss of, of a parent via incarceration or death or substance abuse. All of these kinds of adverse childhood events are important forces as well in individual children's lives. So why do we, why do we care? Why do we... What's the big deal about these adverse events, these so-called ACEs? Well, we know that they have profound effects on outcomes that we carry, care very deeply about. So if you look at this bar graph, this shows on the horizontal axis the ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences, and on the vertical axis is the lifetime experience of depressive symptoms and mood disorders among children experiencing these various levels of adverse uh, childhood events. And you can see that there is this very powerful graded stepwise association with children with 
greater numbers of ACEs experiencing more in the way of depression and mood disorder symptoms. The same is true of uh, development. If we look at uh, developmental delays over the first three years of life, exactly the same story, this stepwise graded association with children with more ACEs experiencing more in the way of developmental delays. It even extends beyond childhood. The things that happen in childhood do not stay in childhood. They move on into the decades of adult life. And this shows that cardiovascular risk factors in adulthood also co-vary as a function of ACEs experiences in children. But there is this interesting and well-kept secret in these bar graph associations that I've been showing you. And it is the one that comes out when you begin to look at individual data points. And here are those individual data points. Underlying these bar graphs are these, these, this great vari variation in the character of the association between ACEs and these various health outcomes. So this tremendous variation is something that has characterized all of this field for the years in which it has been uh, examined. And we began years ago asking the question, is this, is this a noisy association? Is this really noise that we're trying to get rid of here? Or is this actually the music? Is this the music that we ought to be listening to that will tell us more about why there is this great variation between children in their responsivity and the effects of these adverse events? So we began bringing children into laboratory circumstances where we sat them down in front of a... Uh, an examiner that they hadn't met before, and asking them to go through a series of mildly stressful, challenging tasks. Age-appropriate, ecologically valid, things like a drop of lemon juice on the tongue, uh, repeating a string of digits uh, back, and back to the examiner, watching an emotion-evoking uh, video clip. And while the kids were doing these uh, tasks, we began uh, sampling uh, in the periphery the manifestations of the, the reactivity in the two principal stress response systems in the human brain. That is the cortisol system, which has powerful effects on the immune system and the cardiovascular system, and the fight or flight response system, which is the autonomic nervous system that gives us sweaty palms and tremulousness. So we had these very standardized laboratory uh, measures that we, uh, that we derived from having these children go through this 20-minute protocol. Let me show you what the, the data actually looked like. On the left here is about 80%, a representative um, child from the 80% of the samples that we studied. And you can see that these yellow data points that denote uh, mean arterial pressure over the course of time as the children uh, completed these laboratory challenges. And you can see that the mean arterial pressure is relatively low and relatively invariant from task to task. That contrasts with the children with the purple data points here, which, who constituted about 20% of our samples, which show a, a, an increase in mean arterial pressure and a tremendous amount of variation uh, from task to task. These were the highly reactive children uh, that constituted uh, a part of our sample. So we now could take these data and move them in to the experiences of the child in the real world. And now we were going to be able to test things like, uh, in, in real life conditions, do low stress conditions or high stress conditions have effects on these kinds of illness outcomes that we care about, behavioral disorders, respiratory disease, injuries, and so on. So here's what, here's what we found. We found that the children with these yellow data points in the laboratory, the relatively non-reactive children, had relatively little increase in stress-related illnesses when they experienced naturally occurring stressors in the real world. By contrast to that, the children with the purple data points in the lab, when they were being reared in high-stress families, communities, schools, they had the highest rates of these illness outcomes of any of the children that we studied in any of the samples um, over the years. This is what we had expected to find, that these highly reactive, stress-reactive children would have substantial elevations in stress-related disorders under conditions of naturally occurring stress. What we had not anticipated was the other purple data point shown here. 
which shows that the children who were equally reactive in the laboratory, but being reared in low stress, predictive, predictable, nurturant conditions, they had not just average levels of stress-related illnesses and disorders, they had the lowest rate. So here was a group of children who had either the worst outcomes or the best outcomes, depending upon the character of the social context in which they were uh, being reared. We began as a kind of shorthand to call uh, these children with the yellow data uh, dandelion children to invoke the, the hardy dandelion flower that can grow in fertile mountain fields, but can also grow in the cracks of sidewalks and in brick walls and almost anywhere you plant a dandelion seed. And of course, we also coined this neologism of, of orchid child to denote the children who, like orchids, flourish and do beautifully under conditions of nurturance and care, but under conditions of neglect and stress, wither and, and fade. So who are uh, these orchid and uh, dandelion children? Well, the, the dandelion children are those children who showed the pattern of high reactivity in the laboratory. They are often extroverted children, uh, not always, but they tend to be outgoing children. They are comfortable with novel situations, and they have this interesting characteristic of being, with regard to their health, relatively indifferent to the, to the level of stress and adversity that they're experiencing. By contrast to that, the one in five children who uh, were characterized as orchid children were often shy, not universally, but most often shy. They tended to withdraw from novelty. They had these uh, sensory hypersensitivities, and they were children who had this characteristic of having either the best health outcomes or the worst health outcomes of all of the children in our sample, depending upon the social context in which they found themselves. Most importantly, these two phenotypes of children, the dandelion and the orchid, define the two poles of a spectrum of sensitivity to the physical and social world. Now, where, are these, where does these dandelion and orchid um, uh, profiles come from? Well, we know, first of all, that they come from genetic variation. But genes are, are interesting because they are like books that are packed in boxes. Those books have to be unpacked, removed, opened, and read in order to inform and, and ex uh, change the experience of an individual child. And what does the unpacking, it turns out, is the social context, uh, the kinds of experiences that children have within that social context. So it is neither genes nor environments in isolation, but actually genes and environments in combination, which seem to be affecting the development of one phenotype or the other. And we now, in the last uh, 12 years, 10 years, have begun to be able to see exactly how this happens. And it happens by virtue of the epigenome. It is a matrix of chemical tags that lie atop the genome and regulate the packing or unpacking of uh, various genes. So genes can be either unpacked or packed. It's regulated by these chemical tags that lie atop the gene. And those chemical tags come by virtue of the social experiences that children have in schools, in caretaking uh, circumstances, and in their homes. So we now believe that the epigenome is really the, the nexus, the point where the external world touches the biological self. So what allows a dandelion child to thrive? We, well, in our clinical work with these children, we have found that there are six general strategies that both parents and teachers and caregivers seem to be able to use that enhance and allow an orchid child uh, to flourish. One is the parent's recognition and allowing the expression of that child's one true self. One of the most profound, important uh, um, tasks of parenting is to discover who that child is and allow the blossoming of, uh, blossoming of that child into that one true self. Routines and sameness, uh, these are good for all children, but they seem to be particularly important for orchid children. The Latin word caritas, which means steadfast love. Again, tremendously important for all children, but especially important for these sensitive orchid children. 
parents who allow the celebration of human differences rather than the obscuring of human differences. Imagine it to play an important, important component of children's experience. And finally, balancing uh, fear and danger with mastery and moving a child into experiences that may feel fearful, but um, uh, allow a period of, of mastery and a, an experience of victory over that fear. And of course, this forms this nice little <laughs> mnemonic <laughs> of orchid. So I, I believe that the divergence in trajectory in life course of my sister's life versus my own is likely attributable to the reality that I was a dandelion and Mary was an orchid. And these differences in our sensitivities to a difficult and sometimes troubled family environment launched our lives in tragically different directions. We, we all now live in a period of time of resurgent disregard for the care and protection of the world's most tender and powerless of people. The, the, the defenseless are bullied and mocked. The poor are blamed for their poverty. Refugees are turned away. And the lowly of our populations are ignored. And more often than not, it is the children of our nations who are the most sensitive, the most susceptible of all of the powerless, all of the unempowered people uh, in the world. So at a very real sense, at the level of, of, of populations and, uh, and societies, it is the children of those societies who are the orchids of our, of our world. But for the children who are the most orchid-like, the most sensitive, the most susceptible of all of the children in our midst. Here is the good news that I want to convey to you and I hope I have conveyed to you by summarizing this emerging uh, science. It is this, it is sometimes the children about whom we worry most who have the most brilliant and promising future and promise. And under conditions of uh, support and steadfast love, we know now that troubled childhoods that these orchid children can sometimes have can give way into lives of enduring health, of positive development, and astonishing achievement. Thank you.